Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm again very honored to be in your presence, and if it gives you any consolation, you won't be the only dinosaur here, <laughs> because uh, I, I'm not a scientist and I'm not using the... But um, I'll be very brief, um, and because, again, as a musician, I'm well aware that I should not be talking about music. Uh, I may speak about music makers, but not about music, because it is very difficult to describe. And in most cases, these instances, when speaking of music makers, we look into the biography of the subjects to gain a better understanding of the composer or performer. We look at his or her scholastic achievements, especially in learning how to read music and the progress made in playing an instrument. In the history of music, we've had child prodigies and musical geniuses. They're not necessarily one and the same, but when we encounter someone who at a very early age can reach both a mastery of an instrument and start improvising or composing, we can be sure of an unusual predisposition for music. In the, in the West, the first composer that jumps to my mind, of course, is Mozart. Mozart's father taught music to his son from the age of four, and when only six years old, started to take him on a tour, on tours throughout Europe, having him appear as a young prodigy in Prague, Munich, Paris, London, and later even in the Sistine Chapel. There in 1771, Mr. Fitzgerald, when he was about 15 years old, he heard a performance of Gregorio Allegri's Miserere, and went back in his boarding house. He wrote out the entire 11 minute long piece from memory and showed it to his father. Of course, the father was absolutely ravished because that piece, that composition, there was no right for it to be outside the walls of the Vatican. It had to remain. So the father returned it to the Vatican, of course. The incident, however, shows an uncanny power of concentration and an exceptional musical memory. We should also add that Allegri wrote the piece in 1603 in a style totally foreign to styles fashionable in 1771. And speaking of styles, Mozart's father insisted that young Wolfgang learn the variety of styles in favor in each of the towns or courts they would visit. This way he could both make a greater impression on their hosts and acquire a stylistic versatility allowing him to please his listeners, wherever they may be. But we are, however, here to not to celebrate Mozart, who deserves everyday celebration, but rather to pay tribute to Ostar Nur Ali Elohi. But when reading his bio biography, I was struck by two things that they have in common. One, they were both born within a family where the father took care of the son's education, and they were both musical geniuses. There stopped the similarities because they grew in totally opposite milieus. When, while Mozart's father had his son practice assiduously and put all his efforts in promoting his career, Ostad Elohi's father, Hajnei Matt, was his name, had a special small-sized tambour, that's the, the instrument, a small instrument, which was two string and later it became, uh, he added a third string to it, made for his son so he could learn to play the instrument. Because of the father's name and fame and reputation, both as a spiritual leader and a great tambour player, many mystics of the region would visit him. Among them, there were also some excellent musicians who took some time to teach the young boy. It is reported that by the age of nine, he was already considered a peerless master on the tambour, fully familiar with the technical subtleties of the sacred Kurdish, Lorish, Persian, Turkish, and Arabic, even some Indian traditions. So we see the styles that Mozart would have learned for nothing, but here he learned not styles, but traditions, and traditions of sacred music. These are some of the components of Ostad, Ostad Elohi's technical prowess. Mozart's father was a very pragmatic man, a hard-working musical pedagogue who was struggling to meet the everyday difficulties of earning a living and having some semblance of econ economic security. Hajjane Matt, however, had no such concerns, and at the age of nine, Nur Ali began 
a 12-year cycle, when he was nine years old, a 12-year cycle of ascetic retreat under his uh, uh, father's attentive atten uh, supervision. Ustad al later recollected that period writing, writing, during the 12 years of ascetic practices in my youth, I would take up my tambour every night and play sacred music. We veils were lifted. Sometimes I would find the room flooded with sunlight and then realize that I had spent, spent the entire night playing the tambour and singing. This ascetic retreat meant fasting in 40 days increments, at times for 10 to 15 days between fasts. About his youth and adolescent period, he later wrote, what times were those times? What an atmosphere indeed. We were constantly praying and singing sacred songs and had no idea what was going on in the outside world. Obviously, so many years of focused practice led him to a great virtuosity dictated not by a need to outdo other players, but a need, by needs to express his thoughts and spiritual development. He therefore experimented with other ways of playing the tambour, putting aside the plectrum and plucking the strings with his five fingers. Likewise, instead of using two fingers, he used all the five fingers of the left hand on the fretted neck of the instrument. He also had many different kinds of tambours, especially made for him. But all of these changes were not dictated by, novel, for, by novelty for novelty's sake, but rather to satisfy his contemplative quest. At the same time, enriched, he enriched the repertoire of the tambour with over 100 pieces. He was later on, however, disturbed by not having any idea of what was going on in the outside world, and later decided to abandon the traditional secluded life of, ascetic, of the ascetic and felt it his duty to live a normal life among the people and be of service to society. He moved to Tehran, studied law. He, he studied law, a three-year course. He studied it in six months. Uh, and jurisprudence to reclaim, and this is what he says, to reclaim the rights of the oppressed from the oppressors. He applied all his knowledge and wisdom in his various appointments as surrogate judge, attorney general, or chief justice. And then he said, when performing my duties as a judge, I would do things no one else dared to do, for I was accountable to God, not to the ministry of justice, and I was not afraid of anyone. Of course, he paid the price for it. He was all the time moved from one town to another and because the people would not have him do his way. And he later felt that a single year spent in the judiciary, in the judiciary taught him more than 12 years of uninterrupted asceticism. Of course, the, these 12 years of, of asceticism taught him one very important thing. And that was willpower. And his years of the, with the judiciary tested that willpower. He came to retire from the judiciary in 1957 and to settle in Tehran, devoting himself to his writings, teachings, and secret music. He published at first in, uh, a first book entitled Demonstration of Tooth, then published his father's The Book of the Kings of Truth, and then his own commentary on that book, and then the, uh, he, finally his magnificent uh, Knowing the Spirit. Knowing the Spirit has been translated into French, uh, Connaissance de l'âme. I find the, he, the more you know the, his spiritual writings and sayings, the better you can enjoy, enjoy and benefit from his music making. They are inseparable. For him, I'm quoting him, one should not limit music to a purely aesthetic use, nor solely take into account its technical aspects. The important thing is to hear those true celestial harmonies. Music should be considered as a means of spiritual communication, not as a goal in itself. To love God, and said, he said, one must first relinquish the ego. And because his music is not self-centered, 
but egoless. He opens curtains of noise to facilitate the traveler's path to his source. His music was part of his teachings when he wanted to take his listeners where words could not. He was convinced that with the ability to defend spiritual truth comes a duty to inform others. Failure to do so is a form of spiritual betrayal. He did so relentlessly, relentlessly proving his unshakable willpower and commitment, making him a unique example not only of a musician, but of someone of deep intellectual and moral virtues. Today's conference being devoted to a common morality, I would like to close this short presentation by quoting Ostad Elohi. The acquisition of moral qualities requires spiritual aptitude rather than material education. And I would like to ask him if he was with us, how can we create spiritual aptitude? Thank you.